Well, I trust you've been blessed in Romans so far. We've gone through four chapters. We're coming to chapter five today, and this is kind of a transition chapter into growth. And so this is going to be a great blessing for you. Chapter five really is this in the book of Romans. It's the theme of more grace. Uh, we're told in the word of God that by grace we are saved, but it also tells us in the book of James that there is more grace where that came from. And the more grace is for your growth. It's for daily life. You never leave the grace of God. The grace of God is what convicts you. It's what, when you get born again, it, it, it uh, gives you life and uh, energizes you and so raises you, as in essence, from the dead like Jesus was. It quickens you. But then also, it's what gives you daily life. Everything that God gives you is a blessing. And uh, so we receive for salvation, but every day we receive more of our eternal life. And I don't mean that you gain more life and that you're going to live long, live longer because you can't. You're going to live eternally. But what I'm saying is everything having to do with eternal life is given you by grace. That would be your daily life, your daily joy, your daily peace, your daily progress, your family life, your relationship life, your church life, your finances, all the blessings that God has given you are received. In fact, we're even told under Jesus' ministry that the blind receive their sight. That again comes back to to the grace of healing. And so all these things are found in the Word of God. That is the essence of chapter 5 of the book of Romans. And so after salvation, not only again do we need grace to be saved, but then we need added grace or increased grace or more grace to become the disciple that God wants us to be. In verses 1 through 5 of chapter 5 of Romans, we come to this. Five results of justification. First of all, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Next of all, we have security in life and in death and in eternity. And so the security that God gives us means that every time we mess up, we don't have to fear that we're no longer part of his family. No, we understand his grace is there to bring us back into fellowship with him. We have blessings in pressure. We have love from the Holy Spirit that increases in our life as our knowledge of the word of God increases. So again, this comes back to the grace that God gives to us. And we also have character growth in our life. Verses six through nine of this particular chapter, chapter five of Romans is this, our condition when God found us. We find out what we are at the beginning of chapter five, but then he goes back and momentarily says, let's go back for just a meanwhile. A few years ago, before you knew Jesus as Lord and Savior, you were unrighteous. You were a sinner. The enemies of God headed to hell and eventually to the lake of fire. There was no motivation for a normal man to die for us, but in that condition that we had, Jesus Christ chose to die for us. We had nothing, un we had nothing lovable. We had nothing in us that caused God to desire us, only the love of God. God's love for us didn't look at what we have. It looked at his own character. And God decided he loved the world so much, he gave his only begotten son, that if we just believe in him, we will have everlasting life. Jesus was not motivated by our worth. He was motivated by his love for us because we had nothing in us to desire, nothing worthy in us. You know, in the Old Testament, when the um, leper came before the priest, he brought two birds with him, and the, and the Hebrew says those were sparrows. Uh, chapter 10 of Matthew says, aren't two sparrows sold for a farthing? That was the cheapest bird you could buy. A farthing is three-eighths of a cent, would buy two of those birds, and this is what the, probably the only thing that the uh, leper could afford, and so he brought those. But in essence, one bird stands for us, and one bird stands for Jesus. One was slit open, cut open, and its blood was mingled with water, and it was allowed to uh, go into a bowl, and they dipped the living bird into that and then allowed it to go free. Jesus is the bird that died for us. We are the bird that's been dipped in his blood, in his, in his water, the Holy Spirit, and the word of God, and the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. Then we're allowed to go free because whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Notice Jesus became a sparrow for us. He didn't come to this earth as an eagle to die for sparrows. He came to this earth as a sparrow to die for the cheapest of us, the lowest of us, and that's what he did on the cross. He became the lowest of us, identified with us on the cross. And so this, again, is the essence of the love of Jesus Christ. And again, no motivation as far as any natural person is concerned to die for us, but Jesus Christ did it out of his incredible love. Verses 10 and 11, we have the ministry of reconciliation or the removal of the barrier between God and man. The barrier used to be sin. In fact, you still ask people today, what's the barrier between you and God? They say sin. And so the, here's the question. If the barrier is still sin, then God can have no contact with the barrier to destroy it. Neither can we destroy it because sin is bigger than we are. No, Jesus became the barrier. Jesus became sin and then destroyed sin. And so the essence of it is, is the barrier between God and man is no longer sin. The barrier between God and man is Jesus Christ. 
What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. He didn't say try to get rid of your sins, clean up your life, come to God, because you cannot clean up your life. You're in no condition to clean it up. So again, we come back to it. The ministry of reconciliation was now God has taken two warring parties, and through the death of his son, which he identified with man and with God, he has brought the two together. And all we have to do is receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In eternity, our sins are not going to be what sends us to hell. It's rejection of Jesus Christ. Those names not found written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. Verses 14 through 19, we have Adam, we have Adam and Christ compared to each other and then also contrasted to each other. Let's take a look at that for just a moment. One man's disobedience condemned all men, but one man's obedience opened the door for all men to be reconciled to God. The ministry of reconciliation was in those verses before. Now we have the fact that we can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. We had no choice to be in Adam, but the God gives us a choice to get out of Adam. We have the freedom to say yes to God and actually be transferred out of Adam, die in him, die in Satan's kingdom died at Satan's family and been reborn into Jesus Christ's family. So that is the choice that we have. Again, Adam gave us no choice. We're born into sin, but we have a choice to get out of sin and get out of death and to receive eternal life. So that's the choice that God gives to us. Adam's choice cost us, but Jesus Christ's choice blesses us. Adam's choice brought death to every one of us, and Jesus' choice gives us eternal life and the blessings in this life. Adam's choice brought us into sin, but Jesus' choice brings us out of sin and into righteousness. What a wonderful comparison between the two. Verses 20 and 21, the purpose of the law in, God, is in God's plan for man, the law was introduced to magnify the real problem and then to tell the real answer. The law was never designed to say because it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should remove sin or it's also impossible that the works of the law should save any man. There is none righteous, no, not one. We cannot meet God's standard. And so the law and the sacrifices do two things. The law tells us we are a sinner and the sacrifices show us the way out of it because every sacrifice points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin brought death into our life and continues to drive us toward death in our daily lives. Grace reigns in our life through righteousness and that is the new nature. When we allow the new nature in us to control us, we live in joy, we live in peace, we live in righteousness. We also live in the natural blessings of life such as healing and God prospering us and blessing us when we learn to live from the inside out through that righteousness there instead of letting, letting our flesh prevail. So sin results in death, but righteousness results in eternal life and eternal rewards for the deeds that we have done in this life. Chapter five is going to be great. You're going to really enjoy chapter five. I'll see you a week from now and we'll talk about chapter six.